fracture fracture okay in fact these are two different uh, topics two different classes this is of external nose is one class and nasal bone fracture is another class so i have combined two classes into one and if possible we will try to cover nasal bone fracture too and if it is not possible then we will only cover the diseases of external nose okay so if you remember well uh, during the last class we talked about anatomy and physiology of nose so anatomy and physiology is important uh, in, in when we are uh, dealing with any diseases of any parts of the body because that will help us to better understand and uh, the more we go into the diseases the more we understand about uh, the applied anatomy and physiology okay so now we are 50 students so okay now we begin okay so this slide is from your last class okay so before going into the diseases of external nose we need to know what external nose is so let us recapitulate okay and the external nose is an osteocartilaginous framework the upper one third is bone and the lower two thirds is cartilage okay so this is the dorsum this is the root okay nares and what lies in the middle is the columella and these are the openings which are called nostril or nares okay and this is the philtrum okay this is the deep okay the supra tip area and this is the columella what lies between the two nares okay so just uh, for you to recall okay now how do we classify the disease of the external nose okay it can be congenital nasal swelling okay external nasal deformities inflammatory disease which includes uh, which can be either acute or chronic in acute there is uh, furuncal vestibulitis and impetigo in chronic there is tb syphilis leprosy scleroma Similarly, there are benign tumors like rhinophyma, papilloma, hemangioma, and malignant tumors like basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. Okay. So some slides are in detail. Okay. But it is always good to know all these diseases in detail. And even if you can't uh, remember everything, at least try to know the disease and uh, their basic principles. Okay. The congenital nasal swellings. Okay, these are of the four types. Okay, nasal dermoid, nasal meningocele, nasal meningoencephalocele, and nasal blyma. Okay, so these are very similar, but they are again very different. Okay, they have so many differences among them. Nasal dermoid, meningocele, meningoencephalocele, and nasal blyma. So nasal dermoid is the commonest uh, congenital nasal anomaly. So what is nasal dermoid? Like any other dermoid, it is epithelial lined cavity or sinus tract containing skin appendages. Okay. And it occurs commonly in the midline or nasal dorsum, is nasal pit or sinus or nasal mass. Dermoid may extend intracranially but differ from encephalocele. Okay. So this is the point that I want to I wanted you to understand. Okay. So the dermoid and uh, encephalocele, they are quite similar. They appear as a swelling on the nose. But the difference is that uh, with crying or coughing, the encephalocele they enlarge, okay? But the dermoids, they do not enlarge. They have the fixed shape and size, okay? So whenever you see swelling on the nose, suspect it to be a dermoid or encephalocele or meaning encephalocele, okay? So again, the dermoid are of three types. So just try to understand it, okay? So this is the nasal bone. So anything present below the skin and above the bone is the simple dermoid, okay? And here you can see there is a dermoid, the swelling, and it is extend extending inside. So it is dermoid with a sinus, okay? And now there is another, this is dermoid and uh, and this is uh, so it is continuous with the brain. So this is dermoid with intracranial uh, extension. Okay, so these dermoids or sebaceous cyst or anything like this, they are very common presentation on head and neck. Okay, and uh, but if it is okay, if it is present in the skull or if it is present uh, on uh, other parts of the body, 
Okay, you don't have to worry much. But if it is present on the nose, always suspect that it may have intracranial extension. So do not be aggressive and proceed with uh, proceed with surgery directly. Okay. So uh, you know you you may need to go from some radiological uh, investigations like MRI, so as to see or CT scan, so as to see if there is any bony defect or not, or if there is any continuity with the brain or brain tissue or not. Okay. So you do not want to operate on this, the dermoid with intracranial, uh, so what I mean to say is that the dermoid with intracranial extension and a simple dermoid may look similar externally, but the pathology extends up to the brain here. So you do not want to operate this patient, the dermoid with intracranial extension, the same way as you operate simple dermoid, okay? The management is quite different. So we'll talk about how they are managed. Now CT scan reveals bony defect here, yeah, definitely. And MRI differentiate dermoid from brain tissue, okay? And biopsy is to be avoided, okay? So whenever we suspect in surgery, okay, ENT surgery, general surgery, any other surgery, whenever we suspect a mass uh, and we're not sure about the diagnosis, we always tend to uh, excise it and send for biopsy. But here, in cases of dermoid, just do not do any biopsy because it will have, it may have intracranial extension, okay? So, after other diagnosis made, the treatment is complete cyst and sinus tract excision, okay? And if the excision is incomplete, it will lead to recurrence. For intracranial extension, so you need to also call craniofacial and neurosurgical, okay, neurosurgical team and and then uh, we need to debride the whole tract and all the extensions. Now, this is a sinus with a tract. And here, look here, the, the cyst has, uh, the swelling has been excited in completion, okay? And including the tract. Now, nasal meningosine. It is herniation of meninges, okay? Is that containing CSF into nasal cavity or some via bony defect in the skull base? Okay, the patient may have history of chronic rhinorrhea and recurrent meningitis. On examination, there is cystic mass in the nasal cavity or nasal dorsum. Transimulation is present, it is compressible and positive impulsion. Coping. Okay, so these are the points that will help you to differentiate between dermoid and a meningocele. seal. Okay. Because it is cystic, it is filled with CSF or fluid. So it is definitely compressible. And because there is fluid, it is transcendent. Okay. And uh, when the child coughs, okay, there is going to be a positive impulse on coughing. So, but the same doesn't happen in case of dermoid. So CT scan is suggested for degree of bone defect. And MRI is done to rule out encephalocele. Okay. And you do not do biopsy because there can be risk of meningitis. Okay. So uh, in the last class, I showed you uh, endoscopic emails. Okay. And in the periphery and many places, uh, like, uh, you know, the people who are not ENT surgeons or not even doctors, and, uh, you know, they suspect some nasal mass to be a polyp because the polyp is a very common condition and they just pull it out try to evolve it and this can result in severe complications, okay? So whenever, you know, like, uh, whenever you are not sure about the diagnosis and whenever you have any confusion, always go for investigations and CT scan and include, uh, combined with MRI, they are very good radiologic uh, investigations in ENT diseases and especially the nose because nose is a big organ and there are so many areas that we cannot see properly by uh, you know, regular examination. So, uh, you know, it's always better to over investigate the patient than under investigate him and uh, go, go into some complications. Okay. So, the treatment is surgical excision and repair of the dural and bony defect. Okay. This is an endoscopic image. So, you should know, uh, you, you may have heard about NPL, nasopharyngeal laryngoscopy. Okay. So in that we pass a flexible endoscope in the nasal cavity to see what is inside the nasal cavity. Okay, so there is a mass like this. Okay, 
So uh, those who are not, not aware, they may think that it is just uh, an intracoronal polyp and just try to evolve it, but uh, this will result in serious complications, okay? And this is an MR image and look here. This is the area of the meningocele. Now nasal encephalocele, okay? It is not much different from meningocele. So it is the hardness of the brain matter plus meninges by a bony defect in the skull, okay? Only when it is meninges with uh, CSF, it is meninges, okay, it is meningocele with the uh, meninges and uh, CSF. But uh, when there is also brain tissue, including CSF, so it becomes encephalocele. So this is a typical presentation, okay? And look here, the brain is coming all the way down here, okay? Into inside the nasal cavity, and there is the bony defect here. Okay, clinical features and management. Okay, history of chronic rhinoid and recurrent appendicitis, uh, just like in meningocele. There is cystic, uh, compressible, transmuted swelling on dorsal nose and post impulsion, coughing. Okay, CT scan for degree of bony defect and MRI for degree of brain herniation. Okay, and uh, biopsy is contraindicated for the risk of meningitis. And surgical excision plus repair of dura plus bony defect. Okay, so the management is similar for meningocele and intercalocele because they are essentially very similar diseases. Only the content is different. Now, nasal glioma collection of glial tissue outside CNS, central nervous system, due to ectopic neural disease or disease of encephalocele. Okay, here in encephalocele. You can see the brain tissue is in continuity with the nasal cavity. All right. So these are of three types here. Uh, it is the pinched of encephalus. Okay? The tissue, uh, they, they are not in direct continuity. So these are of uh, three types, intranasal, extranasal, and combined. So it is non-compressible mass of nasal dorsum, does not increase on size and coffee and does not transmit. And the treatment is complete surgical excision. Okay, look here. This is extranasal, and this is here in the intranasal. This is the brain tissue, this is also the brain tissue, and this is also the brain tissue. But here, this is not in continuity with the brain. Okay, the meninges is normal here and here too. Okay, and this is the brain tissue present outside the cranium, okay? Now, external nasal deformities, okay? So all these four, four diseases, okay? Uh, dermoid, meningocele, encephalocele, and nasal glioma, okay? They are very important. And uh, you need to know the management and how to differentiate between them. Definitely, you, know, you don't need to operate them, but <laughs> So, uh, but as MBBS, if you are working periphery or even in center, so you should not become very enthusiastic to get them operated. Okay, when you were okay, it happens like like when uh, we had just completed MBBS and when we saw mass, uh, okay, and uh, like we always became interested uh, to just uh, to put on the gloves and just to excise it. Okay, so uh, in case of Okay, when there is a basis on the hand, on the back, or any other places, okay, uh, you, you, you can become enthusiastic, but if it is in the nose, so do not do that. It can lead to serious complications, okay? Better send for CT scan or MRI and try to diagnose uh, the disease confidently. Okay, external nasal deformities. Okay, uh, we'll learn about some names, okay, some phrases. Okay, there are various rhinoplastic techniques, okay? Okay, so as an MBBS, you don't need to do rhinoplasty, okay? But for examination point of view, it is always good to know these terms. Augmentation rhinoplasty, it is done for saddle nose, or reduction rhinoplasty for home nose, corrective rhinoplasty for crooked nose, nasal tip rhinoplasty for tip deformities, LR rhinoplasty for LR deformities, and reconstructive rhinoplasty for soft tissue defects. Okay, do not go into the procedure, do not uh, go into detail in how it is done, just know the names and for what it is done, okay? Okay, so this is saddle nose augmentation, look here. This is a saddle nose and the hair, the saddle nose has been augmented. Okay, 
this person has a hump and hump is very common even i have a hump okay so hump nose reduction okay okay this may appear to be a very common face okay but i don't know who he is so this is a crooked nose okay and here the crooked nose has been corrected and look here the size of the ela you know ELR flare so you may you may uh, you may have seen many people especially old people in whom when they breathe in or breath out there is the flaring of ela you know the layer ela moves out and comes comes to the median okay so that is not very cosmetic so here the ela flare reduction has been done now here the ela has been collapsed and the ela collapse has been corrected here okay this is a elongated tip and here the tip has been made smaller okay but this is so this is tip rhinoplasty and this is the repair of collapsed columella okay the columella has been collapsed here and it has been repaired again okay so this is immediate post surgical and it will heal after some time now this is a case of basal cell carcinoma the carcinoma has been excised with wide local excision but this defect cannot be closed primarily no primary closure can be done okay so a flap has to be brought here to cover this okay so this is a reconstructive uh, rhinoplasty okay so all all of the rhinoplasties that, that i showed you above is cosmetic rhinoplasty and this is a reconstructive rhinoplasty okay now inflammatory diseases Okay, the inflammatory diseases are important for you because they are very common and uh, uh, as MBBS uh, doctors uh, when you're working uh, anywhere, so you'll commonly get this condition, okay? And uh, uh, many a times you need to treat these conditions, but if you think that you're not able to treat these conditions, then you need to be able to refer this patient to ENT surgeons in plenty of time, okay? So... Frugal of nose, it is acute infection of hair follicle by staphylococcus or is commonly seen in nasal vestibule, okay? Vestibule is any opening and nasal vestibule is the opening in the, of the nasal cavity, okay? Now, what causes recurrent frugal, nose picking, diabetes mellitus, and other immunocompromised states? Okay, this one is very common, nose picking. So what are the clinical features? Hard, tender, red nodule over nasal vestibule. Okay, this area, this opening is the nasal vestibule. So it later enlarges to become a fluxant abscess with post point. Okay, purulent discharge on rupture of abscess. Okay, if you just leave it like this, so there is the discharge of the pus. Okay, and remember, this is a very very painful condition. Okay. And sometimes the pain may not be relieved by over, uh, oral analysis. Like the patient may require injectables for relief of pain. Okay, how do you manage this case? Never squeeze, okay? Okay, uh, the patient, so your friends may ask you for advice. Okay, I have a swelling here. What, what, what do I do? So tell him or tell her, don't squeeze it because it lies in the dangerous triangle of the face. Uh, we'll talk about what is dangerous triangle, okay? So heat can be applied because it will help to localize the infection. And the antibiotics, the fluxacillin is given six hourly for seven days, okay? And you get different drugs like also fluxacillin, okay? Or drugs like Megapen, it is a brand name, okay? So it is given for all of these drugs are given six hourly and for at least seven days. And similarly, Mipirushin ointment is applied on the swelling, okay? Locally over here. And similarly, analgesic may be required. Okay, only the paracetamol may not be enough. Okay, and so you need to give a combination of paracetamol. Sometimes if it just doesn't work, so then you need to give higher analgesic and sometimes even injectables. But if a post, if an excess has formed and that is flux went, so we also need to drain it. Okay, and drain it and then pack it for the drainage of the pus. And if the patient has diabetes and other predisposing factors, then they always need to be corrected. Now, here in this slide, we talked about the dangerous triangle of the fish. So, what is the dangerous triangle? Okay. 
it is formed by root of the nose and bilateral angles of the mouth okay facial veins which are bulbous they drain this area and it is connected with cavernous venous sinus okay the drainage may be direct the or it may be indirect okay uh, this is good to know okay the superior at least you, you, you know the superior ophthalmic vein okay the abscess or the fungal uh, is not connected directly to the cavernous sinus okay why cavernous sinus is important okay we'll talk about it in today today's class okay so it is connected by superior ophthalmic vein okay and infection in this area like picking up pimple may lead to cavernous sinus thrombosis and meningitis okay so the abscess or pricking okay through the ophthalmic vein so the infection will get transmitted to the cavernous sinus and that will result in cavernous sinus thrombo thrombophlebitis and meningitis and both of these conditions are very very dangerous now this is the dangerous area triangle of the face okay from the root of the nose this is the angle of the mouth and another angle of the mouth so this comprises of the dangerous triangle of the face and any swelling in this area is drained by ophthalmic vein which goes into the cavernous sinus and that may lead to meningitis or cavernous sinus thrombophlebitis okay what are the complications of nasal furlongum okay facial cellulitis okay so you may think that okay this is just a small follic uh, folliculitis or furlongum and it mostly localized but several times we get many patients who have swelling of the whole of the face okay the swelling can rapidly increase okay there can be uh, facial uh, cellulitis and there can be abscess in the upper lip so it can progress to become septal abscess and the most treated is cavernous sinus thrombophlebitis and also vestibular stenosis okay stenosis means uh, becoming narrow and of the vestibule okay vestibular stenosis now okay we, we talked about the cavernous sinus thrombosis why it is uh, dangerous okay because it has a fatality rate of as high as 40 percent okay that is quite high but these days with aggressive treatment with uh, better ICU setups and better management the mortality rates they have been decreasing okay still uh, it is a very fatal condition okay there are so many fatalities uh, if they happen to reach this stage, okay. There's rapid onset and hectic fever, bilateral orbital pain plus severe chemosis, bilateral absent pupillary reflex, bilateral symmetrical axial proptosis, sequential ophthalmoplasia, sixth nerve, third nerve, and fourth nerve, papilledema and loss of vision, and painful paresthesia of the trigeminal nerves, the first and second branches. Okay, this is bilateral chemosis and proptosis. Okay. So nasal vestibulitis, inflammation of nasal vestibule with a recurrent painful crusting due to staphylococcus aureus infection, okay. Etiology, irritative dermatitis caused by constant rubbing of nose due to rhinosinusitis. And treatment is essentially the same, fluxacillin, 500 mg, 6 hourly for 7 days or this is we prefer to give fluxacillin, okay, which is a better drug. And similarly, antibiotic with corticosteroid, uh, it is applied locally twice a day or even sometimes thrice a day for seven days. Okay, so this is the nasal vestibule and look here, there is crusting and then there is the inflammation. Okay, so this is the nasal vestibulitis. Rhinoscleroma. Rhinoscleroma or scleroma is progressive granular metastasis caused by gram-negative clepsila rhinoscleromatis. Commences is nose and then it reaches up to nasopharynx, paranasal sinus, oropharynx, larynx, trachea, and bronchi. Okay, so it is caused by Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis. Okay, it is a granulomatous disease. Okay, so these are the important terms that you need to remember. Okay, so these are the rhinoscleroma nodules. Okay, look here, look, look, how, look the way the nose has been deformed. Okay, hebra nose. Okay, 
So this hypermos occurs in Rhinus chroma. So this is not a very con uh, very very con this is a rare condition. And uh, you know uh, when I was a medical officer and I used to work in uh, the Department of Emergency of here uh, CMC right in this hospital uh, several years ago. There was case uh, who lose similar like this here here even a bigger loss. Okay. And since that time, it was around uh, 10 years ago. And since that time, I've never seen a case like this, even during my residency or later on. Okay, so this is Hebranos, and it is a granul granulomatous condition. Okay, so this condition may mimic uh, a malignancy. Okay, so whenever you, you find a case like this, refer it to an immune disorder. Okay, investigations. Okay, X ray PNS. Okay. Uh, XRP PNS is not a very preferred investigation, but because this is simple and this is very uh, affordable, this is easily done. It shows sinusitis and bone destruction and nasopharyngoscopy, okay? Obliteration of the nasopharynx due to addition between deformed receptor soft palate and posterior pharyngeal wall. Flexible laryscopy, subglotic stenosis, and biopsy is done to confirm the disease so as to rule out uh, any malignancy. And Nucleus cells and Russell body, they are seen. Now, medical uh, treatment. Total duration is six weeks to six months or negative pulses from two consecutive biopsy material. Steromycin, one gram OD intramuscularly and tetracycline 500 mg QID orally is given and repampation 450 mg OD orally. Okay. And then also 2% acrylic flaming uh, solution can be applied locally OD. And uh, similarly, radiotherapy and surgery, uh, they can be done because uh, granulometrous conditions, they are not very common. So uh, we can also skip this. Okay, just know, know that there is a condition of rhinoscleroma, which has a medical therapy and radiotherapy can be done and uh, and also surgery to just to make it appear better and to remove the, uh, the size of the swelling. Okay. Similarly, there is a condition called lupal, uh, lupus vulgaris, uh, vulgaris. It is a tuberculosis of the skin and it can mimic a squamous cell carcinoma. And the nodules have apple jelly appearance. Okay, The treatment is ATD, anti tubercular treatment or therapy. And surgical reconstruction may be required, may be done if required. Okay, So this is lupus vulgaris. Okay? You always need to differentiate it from squamous cell carcinoma. Now, nasal syphilis, okay. Uh, let us not go into detail. Okay, it is the commonest manifestation and usually seen in only in torsion syphilis, okay. The gamma and the sides, okay, you all know about that or you will talk about it in uh, dermatology classes. Okay, this is what a torsion syphilis gamma looks like. What about that? Okay. Okay, investigations. Okay, VDRL test is done, rapid plasma test is done. Okay, fluorescent treponormal antibody absorption test is done. Okay, and dark nasal examination of nasal smear is done. Okay, now treatment is benzathin penicillin. Okay, if the person is allergic to penicillin, then doxycycline or tetracycline and sequestrectomy. Sequestrectomy means it is a dead bone, so you need to remove the dead bone. And because there is nasal deformity and the end, uh, augmented rhinoplasty will be required. Okay, leprosy. Okay, this will also be dealt uh, by another teacher, uh, maybe in the dermatology classes. Okay, so leprosy can also occur on nose. Okay, and a leprosy may result in saddle nose deformity, which will require augmented rhinoplasty. So look here. There's the erosion of the intranasal spine. Okay. Now we are not going to we are going to skip this. Okay. Now this is important nasal vestibular stenosis. Okay. So it can be congenital or it can occur due to accidental trauma or it can occur due to surgical trauma and it can occur due to inflammatory lesions. The treatment is vestibular plasty. By plasty, what we mean is repair. And the when vestibule is to be repaired, it becomes vestibular plastic, okay? So vestibular plastic should be done for many reasons, for cosmetic reasons and 
even for functional reasons, okay, the person if you only breathing through one nose, then is predisposed to many conditions, okay. Now this is important, okay. The tumors, the tumors of the nose, the benign tumors and the malignant tumors, okay. Uh, because we live in Chitwan, we work here and uh, we practice here, so this is a center for uh, cancer uh, in benign malignant. So we tend to get so many cases here, and it is always important to confirm the diagnosis to make sure that it is a malignant case or a benign case, and that it is not an inflammatory disease or any general metastasis, okay? Because the treatment uh, protocol for malignancy and other inflammatory disease, they are quite different. And you do not want the patient to waste his precious time getting treated for the malignant diseases thought to be an inflammatory disease, okay? Because the, some cancers, they spread very rapidly, okay? Now, rhinophyma or potato tumor. Okay, it is condition of marked hyperplasia of nasal sebaceous glands is an end stage acne rosacea commonly affecting males between 40 to 60 years of age. It begins it, it begins as accentuated flux reaction over nasal tip, nasal skin thickens, hypertrophy of sebaceous glands, okay, deformity worsens, there are pits, nodules, fissures, lobulations, and pedunculations. There are different types, granular, fibrous, and fibroangiomatous. Okay. So sometimes you may be asked what, what disease is known as a potato tumor, rhinophyma, rhinostroma, basal cell carcinoma, and hebranos. Okay. So you need to choose rhinophyma. Okay. This is what happens in rhinophyma. Okay. This is not a malign malignant condition, this is a benign condition. And here there are many sebaceous glands and they are hypertrophic. Look here, okay? They are the pits and then there are the swellings and the nodules. They are the pits and swellings and nodules, okay? The treatment. Antibiotic steroid cream for secondary infection is uh, given. Surgery. So partial de debulking or total excision using scalpel, cautery, cryosurgery, chemical peel, or, okay, these are the different methods of Debridement or surgery, okay. The scalpel means the regular blade that we use. The cautery is okay. There are electric cauteries, the hot, you know, like uh, it, it produces heat and that will help to cut and also stopping the bleeding. Cry surgery, you know, uh, the cold, uh, the by the use of uh, cold, it is uh, done and then smell their chemical peel and then it is laser and derma brazen is can also be done, okay. The wound surface is allowed to epithelize or covered with split thickness skin graft. Now here, this is a rhinophyma. The swelling has been devolved. Okay, this has been uh, you know, corrected surgery, was it? Uh, and now this is what it appears like after surgery. Okay, now nasal hemangioma. Okay, you're going to uh, you, you're going to talk a uh, lot about hemangioma in uh, other subjects too. So here I'm going to give you a basic review of nasal hemangioma. It is a benign self-resolving tumor of endothelial cells, and these are the three types. And this is a very common con uh, uh, examination questions. Yeah. Sometimes in the MBBS exam and very often in the PC exams. Okay, capillary hemangioma cavernous hemangioma and mixed hemangioma, okay? So capillary hemangioma is a red mass within the skin surface and it is self-resolving. Cavernous is, uh, hemangioma is blue mass deep to skin surface usually don't resolve. Okay, mixed hemangioma, it is cavernous plus capillary. Okay, it is mostly noticeable by one month, begin to strain by 18th month, 30% resolve by three years, 50% by five years and 90% by nine years. So this is such an easy formula. 30 percent, three years, 50 percent, five years, and 90 percent, nine years. So most of the time, when the swelling is not very big and if it is not creating any problem, you just need to consult the patients, uh, the you know, especially the parents, okay? Because the patients they are uh, they are very small kids, so the patients they are very apprehensive and they are very much worried. So you need to tell them that okay, it, there is no harm in waiting up to the years of nine years, but even if it is resolved by the age of nine years, there is less chance of getting results. So it, it, 
may require to be corrected or removed surgically. Now this is a uh, capillary hemangioma. Okay, this will uh, become better or this will improve by itself. Nothing has to be done. Okay, cavernous hemangioma. Okay, mixed hemangioma. Treatment. Okay, most lesions disappear without treatment. So all that you need to do is to counsel the patients, reassure the patients. Okay, treatment indications. If the eye or ear is involved, if there is frequent bleeding, if there is oscillation infection, or rapid growth, or any other facial deformity, corticoids injected into lesion or given orally. Okay, laser therapy for capillary hemangioma and surgical excision for non dissolving hemangioma. Okay, surgical excision is the gold standard treatment for hemangioma, but this is a very, uh, it is not very easy to. Excise them completely surgically. Now let us talk something about malignant tumors. Okay, basal cell carcinoma. So this is also known as rodent ulcer. So this can also be your uh, MCQ question. Okay, in PC examinations or sometimes even in the license examination. Okay, what is known as rodent ulcer, and then you have four choices. Commonest form of skin cancer, okay, in 85 to 90 percent, but it is least dangerous. Okay, that is a good thing. While it is common, but it is least dangerous because it causes damage by surrounding tissues, but almost it never metastasizes. Okay. Okay, in cancer patient, the death is usually by the metastasis to the brains, to the liver, to the lungs, to the heart. Okay. Okay, so it will uh, grow, but only locally. So the predisposing factors are the light colored skin, sun exposure, and the age of more than 50 years. Now clinical features. Two third of them occur in sun exposed areas. Okay. Commerce location is face. Commerce presentation is shiny nodule or ulcer with raised pearly margins. Can present as a red patch, skin thickening or scar tissue. Diagnosis is by skin biopsy and histopathological examination. Okay. For any cancer, okay, histopathological examination is important because that will help you to pinpoint uh, the diagnosis. So go for biopsy and do the histopathological examination. Stop here, right? Okay, uh, so we have 38 participants now. Okay, uh, so before others join, okay, let us wait for a while. Okay, so we are talking about the malignant tumors. Okay, okay, I have a message here. <laughs> okay, no comments on that. Uh, okay, malignant tumors. Okay, so we talked about basal cell carcinoma. Okay. Uh, okay, so basal cell carcinoma, also known as rodent ulcer, very common, but it is least dangerous. Okay, and these are the clinical features. And here, so the lesion is on the pinna. Okay, so this is a small lesion. Okay, and uh, yeah, and uh, Many people, many doctors, they do not get, uh, sus uh, they do not suspect it to be cancer. They may think that, okay, especially we get cases like this, we come from the periphery and they're treated in a small medical shops by ointments, okay? Different ointments, different antibiotics and things like that, okay? For a prolonged time. And then they come here and thus we do a biopsy, okay? And then send it and in the report there is basis of carcinoma. Okay, nasal lesions, they are very common on the nose, okay? There are many small lesions like this, okay? And th this can be a basal cell carcinoma, okay? And I mean, often times they are not cancers, okay? Uh, because some such lesions, so they are quite common. So, you know, like uh, you do not get worried. Many of you may even have, or many of you have friends or relatives who have lesions like this, okay? So don't worry. Most of the time, they're only warts. Okay, what is the treatment? The treatment is standard surgical excision with 5 mm margin and frozen section histology followed, followed by surgical repair using nasal level flap or median forehead flap, okay? 
So here are a few terms that uh, I need to explain to you. Okay, the nasal level flaps and the median forehead flap. Okay, you never have to do this as an MBBS doctors. Okay, so when uh, the defect is taken out from the nose, so there is very little space for primary primary closure. Okay, so to close that defect, we need to do some reconstruction. Okay. For that, we need flaps, okay? The flaps are brought out from other place and kept in the place of the defect, okay? So there are various sorts of flaps, okay? So, uh, okay, th these are uh, two of them, okay? And the next is 5 mm margin, okay? So by this, what I mean is, okay, when you take out the lesion, you do not only take out the lesion, okay? You take out a strip of healthy tissue all around, okay? So that, uh, so that uh, just expecting that okay the uh, all the area that has been uh, the defect is free of any cancer cells okay and frozen section histology so frozen section histology is while you are doing surgery you can send a small piece of tissue right during intraoperative time for histopathology and you get the re report at the same time okay the benefit is okay uh, if uh, the margin is not enough, okay, like, uh, okay, you, uh, this is the laser and you take out 5 mm. But if uh, the frozen section histology, it says that, okay, on the lateral side or the middle side or, or the lower side, okay, the margin is not free of cancer. So in such case, at in the same sitting or during the same surgery, surgical procedure, you excise a little more tissue, okay. So uh, the, the, this, uh, the, uh, you know, like uh, this service is available in many hospitals, okay? Uh, and the benefit is that the patient will not, uh, will not have to go for second stage surgery. For example, suppose we uh, take out a biopsy and send it for histology. And uh, after 10 days or 14 days, if the report comes, okay, it says that, okay, one of these marks or two of these marks, they are not free. So in such case, the patient will require Revision surgery with a larger margin, okay, wide local excision. Now treatment is by electro dissection and keratins. Uh, okay, keratin used to scrape away soft tissue, soft cancer little pottery, further softens the skin, allowing for the knife to cut more deeply with the next layer of keratins. Okay, chemotherapy can be given, immunotherapy and cryosurgery. Okay. And similarly, radiotherapy, and there is something called photodynamic therapy. Okay, so it is the application of photosensitizers to target area and activation by light, which destroys the target cell. And similarly, there is radiotherapy. Okay, for any cancer, there is surgery, there is chemotherapy, and there is radiotherapy. Okay, so only know the names. Uh, you don't have to. and the 5 mm margin has been uh, taken out here. So if this area is taken out, this cannot be closed primary like this, okay? Because this cannot be put, there will be, uh, you know, it won't look good cosmetically. So a flap has been taken from here and put here, okay? And it will be sutured, it has been sutured here. And again, this area has been opposed and sutured here. And the end result is like a normal case, okay? Similarly, forehead graft, okay, so the last defect and it cannot be closed primarily, okay? And then you take a graft from here and then you close it, okay? So we don't go into detail here. Okay, similarly, forehead flaps, okay? Now, ischemic cell carcinoma, okay? It is the second common nest malignancy, okay? And it occurs in only 10%, okay? The best cell carcinoma is in 90%, 85 to 90%, and it is only in 10%. The clinical features are ulceration with rolled out inverted margins, nodal metastasis seen in 20% of the cases, and early lesion is excised by radiotherapy. therapy, okay? And the advanced lesions are, and the world's uh, surgical excision and flap reconstruction of the defect, and even neck dissections, they are done, because uh, they will have, there will be metastatic nodes, okay? So uh, you need to know because uh, you'll be uh, learning about this terminal disease in your subsequent classes.
Okay, next dissections. Okay, any lesion or cancer on the face or in the neck, okay, they didn't throw the lymph nodes in the neck, okay. And if they're metastatic, okay, like this stomach cell carcinoma, okay, this is a carcinoma, not metastatic. So they are metastasized into the neck nodes. So only if you remove the primary disease, you are not going to treat the patient because it has only metastasized in the neck node. So you also need to do neck dissection to take out those metastatic nodes. So that is why the cancer surgeries, they are very elaborate and they are very extensive. Usually only taking out the primary lesion is not a big task, okay? Sometimes uh, it takes twice or twice the time to take out all the lymph nodes than the time it takes out, it takes to take out the uh, primary lesion, okay? Now this is chemosyl carcinoma, okay? And this chemosyl carcinoma over uh, and versus basal cell carcinoma. Okay, this metastasis, this doesn't metastasize here. You take a wired local margin and excise it and close it. And that usually uh, twist the patient here. You just excise it. And you also remove, need to remove the neck nodes. Okay. Uh, so we have already completed so many topics. Okay. And we have already done 15 minutes. So the today's topic was the disease of the external nose and nasal bone fracture. Okay. So, because this may become overwhelming for you because we have learned so many terms, so many uh, topics and so many diseases. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just uh, keep it for the next class and I'll try to uh, include it in uh, some other lecture, okay? Um, because this is not very long and this is not very much related to uh, the disease of the external nose, okay? So I hope you have understood uh, most of the things that I've told you, okay? Uh, so what you need to understand is uh, one class is not enough for the topic uh, that you have been taught, okay? So as teachers, okay, we are, we are now, uh, you know, because of this online classes and uh, this the corona pandemic, we are more like facilitators, okay? And uh, we usually, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to tell you the topics that are important, the topics that you must know, and what you need to study, and how deep you need to study, okay? In fact, there's no, no limit for study, okay? Uh, and there's no syllabus in the medical education, okay? Uh, any knowledge is not enough, so you study whatever you can, but what you are being taught in the classes, they are the must know, and you do not, and you need to learn them deeply, okay? Do not avoid these topics, and if you can study other topics and even these topics into depth, okay, that is very good for you. In the practice examinations, the externals and even the internals will become very happy. If you can uh, just uh, answer them, answer the questions uh, in a way, in a way uh, more than what they have expected, okay? So, okay, uh, I'm going to end it here. All right, so if you have to say anything, then you can just sit, uh, send a message. And if uh, like if you have nothing, then we, we, we can discuss later on, okay? Okay, then class, okay, have a good day. And uh, because the COVID cases are increasing, so you stay at home and you stay safe, okay? And, uh, okay, I have a next class on Thursday uh, about the disease of the septum, okay? So we'll talk uh, more on that. And if uh, we'll have enough time then, I'll try to include these few slides uh, in that class, okay?